Hi everyone, I am so excited because I'm speaking with author Meredith May and we are talking about her brand new book out just a month. She's going to hold it up and it's called The Honey Bus and I love this. Uh, Meredith, I found this book, it must have been like January or February and I do like on this show, like I'll do book lists about books I want to read and I must have mentioned this book at least a dozen times. I was like, I want to oh, read wow. this. I want to read this. I mean, I love memoirs, first of all, but yeah. second of all, I have like this weird history with bees that I was like, I want to read this book, even though it's going to freak me out. But um, I was raised with a mom who was deathly afraid of bees. And for, I don't even know, I mean, she would she would fall down steps to get away from a bee. Okay. Uh, she, uh, there was this like story about she was pregnant with my brother and she fell down a flight of steps because there was a bee in the house. Okay. So, you know, we, as her, my, my brother and I would have to protect her from, we were like her watch, like if we were outside, like if we saw a bee, we'd be like, okay, we got to get the bee because mom is going to freak out and we don't want to freak her out. So like we were like her bee watchers, right? And oh, then yeah. I, I got married to a man who was deathly allergic to bees, like has to carry an EpiPen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then again, I became this like bee like watcher. Like I had to be, a, you know, then it was more even concerning because one bee sting sent him even with an EpiPen right to the hospital. Okay. Okay. So, so that's really allergic because a lot of people say they're allergic and it's only like their arm swells up oh, no. really big and they say they're allergic. That's not allergic. Allergic is your husband, like his throat closes. He passes yeah. out. Like yeah. he can barely get the EpiPen in him and he passes out. And, you know, so anyway, and then of course his parents are allergic to bees. So then it's always been about like whether my children were going to be. So like as each one of them would get stung, it would be like, you just watch and be like, okay, are you allergic to bees? Are you allergic to bees? Oh my gosh. So this like history of, and I try really hard, like because of being raised with a mom, like I was always like, I'm not taking that on. I'm not taking on her fear. But then I found as I get older, like, I'm like, oh, you know, like I said, you know, with having him and then the kids and, you know, so reading your book, I was like, I, I gained, I gained some respect for these bees that I have, I have a different perspective of them not trying to kill us. Okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm really glad to hear that because that's one of the main points uh, of the book is that you, you are introduced to bees in a different way. And a lot of people are coming up and saying that to me, um, that they're very scared of bees and then they read it and they're like, okay, you know, there's even a word for bee phobia. I is think it, it might be like ap apophobia, like apis is the Latin root wow. word of bee. But um, I also uh, want you to know that I can give you a little tip for your husband. Okay. <laughs> um, you, he can, if he wants to, or your children, if they're really, really, truly allergic, which sounds like they are allergic is throat closing I up. The children so far way. are good. Yeah. The children so far are good. Okay. Well, maybe your husband uh, can find an allergist and they can actually give you weekly injections of yes. venom and that keeps you at a normal level. I do that actually. Do you? Because Yes, I one time had to go to the hospital. I had a reaction like your husband's once. There's a reason for it. I was, but anyway, the point is, so now for the last five years, I get an injection of venom every eight weeks and it just keeps me regular. And if I get stung, I get stung maybe twice a year now. It doesn't even get as big as a mosquito bite. It's just, it, nothing happens. I have no reaction at all. Me neither. So, I have no reaction. I have gotten stung, you know, and I get absolutely nothing. Like a little like dot will show up and that it's weird. I'm like the opposite. Like I don't get reactions from it, you know? So right. it's really weird, but I'm, you know, I'm happy to know, like my mom might've had like some kind of condition of actually really fear, like real fear, you know? Yeah. There's but, a word for it. I, I've, I've seen it before and I can't recall it, but it means specifically fear of honeybees. Interesting. So then that was my other question before we talk about the book, like different bees, you know, like, cause this is about honeybees, right? Mm -hmm. Yellow jackets are wasps. You know, my area in Pennsylvania, we have a lot of yellow jackets and 
I feel like they hunt me down. I don't know. Like, I <laughs> we do. There's whenever I talk about bees, I, before I even get going, I, I give a little 101 the difference between a wasp and a bee, a honey bee. They're very different. Uh, wasps are jerks. And honeybees are awesome. Oh, That's all you, you need to know. But <laughs> wasps are the ones who harass you at your picnic. They're carnivorous. They want your sandwich. And they have uh, smooth stingers so they can sting repeatedly. A honeybee can only sting once because its stinger is barbed. And it, the stinger will pull out, stay in you, and the bee dies. So the honeybee doesn't try to sting you at all costs it's like suicide if they do the wasps are the ones that live in those round paper yep. things that hang from a tree um they don't store honey the way honeybees do they just they do live in a colony but they're out eating everything um yeah and they're they're streamlined and smooth they're like a ferrari and a honeybee would be like a volkswagen bus you know it's like they're, they're totally different, but it gets confused a lot because wasps will chase you. Right. Honeybees won't. Yeah. Right. And, and wa the yellow jacket sting is like, isn't it, you know, or a wasp sting is actually, now I've gotten stung by a yellow jacket and I don't get a reaction, but it's like, it's nasty. It's nastier. Yeah. Right. I, I think. Um, I'm not sure if it is, but um, I think they both hurt. <laughs> but there's lots of quick remedies. You can put toothpaste on a sting if you've got nothing around uh, or mud, yeah, mud, and that'll soothe it like real fast. Right. We've always heard. And another thing about like the yellow jackets are, I think it's yellow jackets that they hover on the ground. There's one kind that hovers on the ground too, around here. And so you kind of got to be careful you know during the summer I always have my grandchildren like be careful on the grass because they'll hover and you can't see them in tall grass mm -hmm. you know and they also yeah and bee, honey beekeepers don't like them because every fall here in California that's when they come out and they try to rob the beehives of honey mm -hmm. so if you have a honeybee colony that's weak they'll take advantage of it and they'll go in and, and attack the bees even if the hive's full of honeybees, the honeybees can guard the entrance, but they're opportunists. They'll take a free honey sample no matter what, and, they, and they'll attack bees and eat bees. I've seen them do that, too. They're, so, yeah, honey beekeepers are anti-wasp, which is, you know, I'm sure there are wasp experts who love wasps, but I personally don't because of my bias. Right. Now I'm like, oh, but the honeybees now are so cute. And they're so, and really, I learned so much about them in your book. And I love that. But let's just start. I mean, the, okay. the cover is beautiful. I love the cover. I mean, it's, and let's show off the covers. You said you have covers from other countries. So let's quick go through. Yes. Them. You want to see the other ones? Yes. Okay. The, this is Germany. Oh, that's so cute. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Um, this one is one of my personal favorites. This is the UK. Ooh. And look, it just real, it's just like gorgeous. The, yeah, the gold. I like how the gold is like really reflective. I like that. And then look on the oh, inside wow. cover, they did this really sweet thing with like Polaroids. Oh, no wonder you, that is my favorite. Isn't that nice? Like it matches the 70s and it has in pencil the little captions that look handwritten here. Yeah, yeah, I love really that. pretty. Yeah, I love that. The um, artist, I found her on social media. Her name is Serpa, I think. Anyway, I'm my, I want to get a piece of her artwork for my oh, wall. It's, oh my she God. is fantastic. Um, this one's really rocking. This is Italy. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's very Versace, right? Yeah, that is. It's like all fashion, you know, like. Yeah, kind of bondage-y. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they changed the title to The Geometry of the Bee. It's interesting how heard... they change titles, too. I always find that very interesting to get to for a certain group of people, you know? Yeah, and I got some explanation of it. Like in certain cultures, honey bus sounds a little too sexy, so they were switching it. I don't know. I get um, okay. <laughs> this, one, this one's Holland, and this is a uh, beekeeper's daughter. Ooh, I, and that also has the gold, like it's catching the light, yeah. you know? And I love that, the honeycombs, like those are, that's really, really pretty. pretty. Yeah, oh, it's I like a so watercolor. you've got such different covers. That's fun. 
It's super fun. And um, it, the, it's published in 17 countries. I only have one, five. I haven't seen the others yet. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I love that. And then, okay, so you start the book off in the prologue. You start in 1980, the summer of 1980, and you call it The Swarm. And I'm going to let you, because it's the beginning of the book and we're not doing any giveaways here, I want you to tell people what happened because this is incredible, okay? Oh, yeah. It's funny I started the book this way because yeah. <laughs> uh, as we were just talking, my book is all about how wonderful and gentle bees are. But I start the book with um a telephone call and someone is calling my grandpa to say there's a swarm in their yard and beekeepers love that because we come get them out of the tree and then we have a free colony with a queen we bring it back (laughs) so we yeah we get in his little dumpy truck and we race down to the it was a, a tennis club i guess and Someone is starts up a weed whacker as grandpa is sawing the branch with the bees on it and the bees kind of fly up in a frenzy and they several of them landed in my hair and so I was getting massively stung. I was like 10 years old and um, I didn't even make a sound. I just kind of fell to the ground and was trying to get them out and grandpa rushed over, pulled them out and made me sit in the truck. And while well, he got the rest of the bees, and he said, honk the horn if your throat closes up. <laughs> Which is pretty scary as a 10-year-old being like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was just stunned. But then um, on the drive back home, you know, my head was full of lumps. It was really hot. But he said, you know, I'm really proud of you. You didn't scream or nothing. And then he said, you know what? You can be a beekeeper. And I was like, you know, wow, I get to be like grandpa. So that was a pivotal moment. Like he talked about that story all through my growing up. He'd always say, like, even when I was in teens, twenties, remember that time you got stung in the head and you didn't even scream. Like he loved that. Oh, you know what I love about this story is that I read so many books about mothers and grandmothers and your grandmother was there too. It wasn't like she was absent, but I ha- I was reliving when I was reading your story, my relationship with my grandfather, because I realized that my children don't have a grandfather. That mm. like, So I was like, my dad died young and, you know, they just don't have. And I was like, wow, I was really lucky. My one grandfather I didn't have, but my mom's dad I did have. And that there's something about that, which I hadn't thought about in a really long time, is that relationship with your grandfather and what I learned from him. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I don't know, I was like kind of tearing up as I was reading your story because I was like, oh, to me, this is a story, to, you know, like for me. And for other people, I'm sure, is that, you know, hearing about it, there were relationships you didn't have in your life, but you had your grandfather. And, you know, it's such a sweet relationship. And, you know, I just wanted to tell you that because I I was like, you know, I don't know how many people have told you that, but I really love the relationship that you had with him. I thought it was so sweet, you know, and you had him for a while. It wasn't like, you know, very little. I mean, you had him for a while and I had my grandfather for a while, too. So I feel really blessed by that. Yeah, I really hit the grandpa jackpot. I really did. <laughs> you know, you did. the the book is really about like that kids from troubled homes they only need one person, one little thing yeah. can turn their whole life from a disaster to this glorious thing. And I really love it when people respond to the book that way because he is such an amazing, gentle, kind brilliant uh, man and he was helping my brother and me in any way he could and he was sort of stuck between a very difficult wife and my mother my grandfather is my step grandfather right I have to keep saying that but in essence he's my dad yeah it doesn't matter right yeah I I don't think it matters I had I had a step I actually had a step grandfather also that you know I lived with for a while and you know I I can't you can't differentiate it doesn't matter especially to a child it really doesn't matter you see exactly you know exactly and he was taking care of us by telling us stories about how bees solve problems and how scout bees find new homes if their home isn't really good for them or how the female worker bees kick the male drones out in winter because they don't 
contribute any work to the hive and they're just extra mouths to feed. So you learn, oh, I better contribute or people are not going to accept me. You know, you learn all these little things. And I didn't realize until I got to be about the age grandpa was when I showed up on his doorstep. Mm. So I'm going to turn 50 next year. That's about how old he was. And he didn't have kids and he never thought he would. And I started remembering all these stories and I thought, oh, that's what he was trying to tell us. You know, you can't be blunt with a little kid about, you know, life and future and emotions and relationships, but you can tell them stories about bees. And if they hold that story, when they get to be older, they may understand what it was about. So that's, and I love that long after I'm gone, uh, grandpa is going to live on. Like he's immortal now and his wisdom is immortal now and his love of nature is immortal because he's in this book. And I just think of someone in South Korea reading about my grandpa in the year 2020 or whatever, 2050, and it just blows my mind. I mean, I think he deserves to never die. Yeah. And, you know, I have my mom was kind of in not the same situation as you were with your mom because my dad was around but I didn't realize till later on in her life like it used to be a joke that my mom would sleep all the time mm. it's kind of like this joke like you have to go wake mom up like you, you know you want to do something you gotta and if she did work but when she was home she slept and mm-hmm. as I got older and she's passed away now I realized like she was depressed like yeah. there was no real definition in the seventies there, you know, for depression. And I remember her taking medicine. She'll take Valium. I remember Valium and Xanax and some other stuff, but it didn't keep her awake. <laughs> Just put her more yeah. to sleep, you know, and it would be a joke, but it's not funny. Like, you know what I mean? It was a joke yeah. in our family, but it's not funny. And, you know, she was absent a lot because she'd be, sl- you know, weekends she just sleep the entire weekend, you know, and then work, come home, go to bed, like work, come home, go to bed. Like it was really weird, but other relatives would mock her and we'd be like, yeah, we have that mom that sleeps all the time. So when I read your, I was like, oh my gosh, you understand that. Like I never knew anybody that had a mom that kind of, you know, she was, what do you call that when you do like, you just protect, like, I feel like that was her happy place. Like, you know, get out, zone out of the world and go to bed, like just go to bed. And then you don't have to deal with anything, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's super confusing as a little kid. Like, as you said, in the 70s, like therapy and anxiety disorder and, you know, um, schizophrenia and all that were not as common. You know, they weren't as discussed. They weren't as, we weren't as open about mental disorder. And there really wasn't an understanding of what mo- might have been going on with my mom and what she needed. Right. Plus, she's got like a bodyguard. You know, she has her mother who, yes. bless her heart, is is nursing and trying to be there for my mother. But she's only amplifying her weakness yes. at the same time, you know. And then you find out in the book why my grandmother is uh, doing this. And there's a family history that um, my that is sort of helping my grandmother feel better. And I feel like she has a second chance with my mother. So she's also kind of feeding something in herself by over mothering or reparenting or infantilizing my mom. Exactly. And And then the kids are stuck going, they don't know what's going on. Right. And it's interesting because us now in our fifties, like we understand, it's almost like you can look back and go, gosh, cause if, if that was what we were doing today, like we know we'd be, somebody would tell us, right? Like they'd be like, okay, there's help for you. You know, there's therapy, there's medication, yeah. there's things that can really help you. Her, like I said, her medication just put her to sleep and let her zone out of everything. But, um, so that I found that I was like, wow, we really have a connection there. Like you understand what that was like to, I didn't have other adult, my grandmother I did have around, but not in the way you had your grandmother. She only lived with us for a little while. But like I said, it was more a joke in my family. It wasn't like we didn't ignore it. Nobody ignored it. But the way they talked about it was like, oh, yeah, she's asleep or, you know, better go wake her up to eat or something. You know, like it was just very joked about, you know. Right. Right. And that's how families handle stuff, too. It's this dark humor. I mean, my brother and I have that. Like we we tell really ribald sort of uh, inappropriate jokes to each other about 
our hurt feelings, you know, that it, gosh, we could never tell those in polite company, you know, and it's, yeah, you know, one of the beautiful things about the book is that um, it is allowing people to talk to me about these yeah. long carried hurts they have with their own parents. And I think it's also allowed people to feel okay about maybe divorcing a parent if they need to do that. That's another big taboo in our culture that you, um, you are always supposed to love your parents. Uh, your no matter how much they may or may not love you. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's generating a lot of really interesting sort of, uh, necessary but difficult discussions yeah but it is necessary because i do think that the more we read about somebody else's like i said i connected with you right away then and it's like oh i'm not that weird i wasn't that weird kid that you know like somebody else knows what that felt like you know mm -hmm. and i would like i would people would come over to my house and she would sleep on the couch so we'd have to like go around her you know, mm. and, be like, and she wouldn't wake up. My God, you could drop a freaking bomb and she wasn't waking up. And, <laughs> you know, it was just kind of like people would be like, oh, your mom sleeps all the time. It's like, yeah, she sleeps all the time. You know, so it was like it was just a known thing, you know. Yeah. But, and even though her presence is closed to the world, it's taking up all the oxygen in the room. Right. Right. Yeah. So one of my challenges as a writer was how am I going to write about my mother when right. her biggest action is inaction she's not doing anything in any right. scene because she's in bed for most of it so I really worried that she she was going to come across as flat or um not very uh interesting at all and it turns out that's supremely interesting to have a like a I don't want to say catatonic that's not the right word but to have a checked out mother is actually super dramatic and so it, that ended up not being the hardest thing to write at all. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, I love this memoir. It was so, I, I, like I said, it was so weird. I've been talking about it for so long to actually have gotten to read it. Then I was like, wow, I've been talking about this book since like January, February. And then I finally got to read it and I loved it. I went through it so fast. I loved it every word. And, you know, I saw that you had written another book. I was, I was thinking, oh, this is her debut novel or, you know, debut book. And then I'm like, oh no, you've written something else too. And, you know, I was just shocked. I'm like, usually people start with their memoir. And then it's like, you didn't start with your memoir. No, I, I tried to. Um, but uh, it, it, there were three versions of it. Um, it took me almost 10 years to write this book. But uh, no, um, one publisher who had passed on it in an, in an earlier version came back six months later and asked if I would ghostwrite the story of a 12-year-old 12 12-year-old 12 Iranian child soldier mm -hmm. um, who was supposed to kill this guy he found in a bunker and instead he couldn't do it. He made a wall out of corpses and hid the guy behind it and nursed him back to health over three days and it's the story that's amazing enough. But what happens is they go their separate ways. They're both captured. They're prisoners of war for a long time. 20 years later, by chance, they sit down next to each other in a help center for torture survivors in Vancouver, Canada. Whoa. Yeah. And they still, to this day, live 20 minutes apart. They're best friends. And it's just this incredible story about, karma and yeah right yeah and mercy and it's it's unbelievable you know they sat next to each other and they're just talking and saying hey are you iraqi are you iranian were you in this war yeah what battle were you in and then the the guy the guy who was saved said yeah this little boy saved my life he was supposed to kill me and it was his said, oh my god that's me my gosh, that is crazy. It? No, that, I yeah. love that. I yeah, love that. so that book was called I Who Did Not Die. Yeah, I, I saw and, that and I was yeah. like, oh my gosh, I want to read that now. Because now that I've read this book, I'm, I love your writing. It, it's oh, awesome. thank you. <laughs> so are you working on anything else right now? I am. I'm in that stage where I'm, things are just bubbling and I'm drawing pictures. And I, I actually want to write a children's book, which is really weird. I don't have children. I have no training in this, but I have a new uh, puppy. Uh, she's seven months, a golden retriever named Edith, and she's inspiring me 
to write something about her, her personality. I'll just say that she's really funny. Um, and then I want to, I realize I like writing memoirs, either mine or other people's. Mm-hmm. So, um, there is a female athlete that I am very interested in writing about and I need to approach her with a letter that's going to make her say yes. <laughs> but, um, I, I can't say who it is because I don't want her to know no, the letter's coming. No, don't say who it is. But you know what? With how well this book is doing, I'm sure that she will say yes. So I think. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. And you are still beekeeping. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have six hives in a community garden in oh, San Francisco. Yeah. And I have, I call him my beekeeping husband, uh, Aaron. He and I take care of those bees. And, um, and yeah, we have to spin some honey on Monday. There's so much honey in the hives right now because it's spring and the flowers are out. So yeah, we're going to be bottling on Monday in my garage. I've got a big spinner I um, bought from Italy. It's super fancy because it goes in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, you know what? I think you are so badass. Okay. <laughs> I think you are too. <laughs> I kept reading when I was reading. I'm like, wow, I she is badass. I mean, there are many people that do this, so you know, that's pretty awesome. And I will think about you when I see my yellow jackets outside. I give them respect. This is what I do. You stay over there. I'm gonna stay over mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I try to respect their space. Okay, that's good. If they want to, this is the worst people, thing you can do. Because that gets them more agitated. And then I've uh, heard that. Even with wasps, yeah. like you shouldn't what should yep. you do? what should I do? Should I just if it's around me? Well, if you've got food on you, you know, give it, it to them <laughs> and walk yeah, away. It. Right. But, but if, it, yeah, going, if I'm just walk going, away. Okay, if I'm going to my car and they seem to be following me, like Oh. Well you gotta get in your car. Um, duck, go fast. <laughs> but don't don't try to hit them because even if you hit them, you're not gonna kill them. They're going to come back at you harder. But I know it's really hard because that's your instinct. Is to... Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. especially in your hair or something, you know, like you're afraid they're going to get. Or I always heard, I used to hear that people would say if you swatted them, they just come, like they get friends and, you know, somehow, yeah. friend, you know, they'll get help. And you're like, you don't want them to get help. <laughs> right. They'll get back up. Yeah. And you can get just the veil. Like you can get like a hat that has netting around it like that. If they're specific in your yard when you're gardening and you just want to you know, feel safe while you're gardening, you can put that on. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, I will tell people around here because I'm telling you, it's an issue around here. They're all over the place, but especially right now in the spring, I mean, yeah. you know, they, they come around and then in the fall, they get nasty. The summer, they they're get hungry. Away, they're hungry in the fall. And then in the fall, they get this like nasty little, you know, jolt in October where you're like, why am I still seeing bees? But they're mm-hmm. nastier than the bees in the beginning, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Meredith. Show up your cover one more time for everybody. Okay. I am going to put the IndieBound link so you can go support your local bookstore. I'm going to put the Amazon because you can get it today if you want to go download it. And I will put your website and all your social media links underneath here too. So, and and whenever you get the, I don't care if it's the child book with, you know, with the dog, I want to read it. Okay. <laughs> and then if Thank you get that, so much. yeah, next book, I want to talk to you. So yes, you- yes. This has been so much fun. Thank great. you. Well, you have a great day, Meredith. Thank you. Bye. Bye.